you know, we had made paper um, artisanally forever, right? Um, and it was mainly made from cloth rags because you need a, a raw material with fiber in it to make the paper. Um, and what happened with the Industrial Revolution, population explosion, literacy explosion, um, is that there weren't enough cloth rags <laughs> to feed this new growing industry. And so right at the time that the whole country in the United States became uh, known for its mass production revolution around the end of the 19th century, uh, paper was looking for a way to be in on that. And there was a 20 year effort to figure out how to make paper from a more abundant source. Um, and so when it came to locating the factories to mass produce this paper, you had this set of a sort of geographical ingredients um, that weren't everywhere. And so um, rivers, rivers with waterfalls, uh, meaning that you could do hydroelectric power in the heart of a huge uh, forest of the right kind of trees. And so that sort of geographic profile, the only place in the East Coast that had it was Maine. And so in the 1880s, um, over the next 30 years, it was kind of a gold rush to the Maine frontier. Working for Maine's paper mills, it wasn't easy work. It was shift work, and there were serious health issues that came along with it. There were moments where it was deadly for some. How did employers in Maine sort of handle that? People think of like factories as assembly lines, um, but paper mills are not assembly lines. They're chemical factories in which each run of paper that starts with logs going through pulp digester um, with chemical treatments into intermediate processes and then 98% uh, water-based um, treated pulp gets sprayed onto a machine that does all these things. It's as big as a football field. Uh, occupational health and injuries, you're working in a chemical factory, you're doing shift work where you work, uh, you know, about 15 or 20 um, night shifts, uh, weeks of night shifts a year. Um, so your sleep is never right. You're exposed to chemicals. Um, just in the SD Warren Mill out in Westbrook, I chronicled five deaths that happened in the 1950s and 60s. So it was dangerous. It was hard. Um, but the employers really, you know, recognized that they needed the allegiance of their workers. And so they built a kind of generous paternalism, higher wages, more benefits, but also kind of an attitude of having a strong relationship with the workers. And that persisted for generations. And what I describe in my book is that when uh, the ownership was no longer kind of essentially local, you know, these, uh, these paper mills in Maine uh, merged with big companies like Scott and Georgia Pacific and International Paper in the 60s and 70s. Um, all of those understandings that people had built up over the years kind of started to go away and uh, the workers um, in many cases rebelled against their new managers. You write that the industry itself changed after World, World War II. How did it change and, and what were some of those changes and why? You kind of have the, the arrival in the 1960s of the MBA, so sort of numbers-driven management, which again kind of goes against some of the culture of the industry. Um, and by the 70s and 80s, there's uh, what economists call the sharehold value, shareholder value movement, where uh, big Wall Street institutional investors started to insist on short-term profit orientation. Most of the decline in the industry happened in the 70s and 80s and 90s when it was really the reach of Wall Street coming in and just undermining the competency of the, of, of, of the workers and the engineers in the mills um, running product lines into the ground, making bad decisions. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned in my book, I interviewed over 150 people, and that was one of the two or three stories that just came through over and over again. You kind of just answered uh, my last two questions in one right there, but uh, I was going to ask you what, what eventually led to the decline of the industry. And it sounds like a lot of people assume globalization, but that's not really true. So one of the things that's funny about the paper industry and really about American manufacturing is that there was always globalization. I mean, there was a global economy that Europeans created through colonialism, you know, 500 years ago. Think about, you know, cotton trade and sugar, rum trade, all that kind of stuff, slave trade. Um, and and so the same was true with paper. Uh, you know, one of the biggest things that happened to the paper industry was in around 1912, uh, newspaper companies got the got Congress to eliminate trade barriers, tariff barriers with um, Canada. So newsprint, which is kind of the cheapest commodity, all went to Canada at that point, with the exception of Great Northern Paper, which was able to uh, compete. One of the stories which you, know, you would have uh, noticed in the book is how Scott Paper, uh, which owned three mills in Maine, two, two being the former S.D. Warren mills, um, 
uh, was struggling in the early 1990s to try and maintain that competence. And when recession and a couple poor quarters happened, Wall Street came in and put in this guy, Chainsaw Al Dunlap, who was famous for ripping apart co companies, laying off workers and breaking up a company. So in two years, um, he eliminated about 40% of the jobs in Scott, but the shareholders walked away with $6 billion in profit. And out of that came the destruction of the historic Hollingsworth and Whitney Mill in uh, Winslow, uh, which was shut down in 97. And, you know, just as an example of how Wall Street, you know, came in and did things that, you know, what, what everyone told me is they would remember the stories of the founders like S.D. Warren and Hugh Chisholm. And they would, you know, say like the communities remembered these great founders. And they said, these guys would be rolling in their graves if they knew what these outsiders were doing to our companies.